This lecture is on difference measurement. It corresponds to chapter four of Foundations of Measurement, but of course there's a great deal more material in the chapter than I can possibly cover uh, in this single lecture. The first thing to say about uh, difference measurement by way of introduction is that conceptually uh, we can think of it as being closely related to geometry. Uh, the two most fundamental notions of geometry. Uh, in fact, let's say the most important notion that one remembers, I think, uh, casually from geometry is that of congruence. And the simplest notion of congruence is that of congruence of line segments. Well, congruence of line segments just correspond uh, to a, a comparison of uh, line intervals. Uh, in that sense, uh, uh, axiomatizations of geometry that use intrinsically and in an important way, uh, the concept of congruence uh, are closely related to what uh, we want to cover in this lecture uh, about difference measurement. That's a kind of uh, historical background. Now, a characteristic feature of uh, difference measurement, as we'll discuss it in this lecture, and as it's discussed in chapter four, is that we deal only with a one-dimensional case. We don't really deal with the geometry. Uh, that's a separate topic uh, talked about in another lecture. So from a geometric standpoint, you might even say, uh, what we're doing in this lecture is not very interesting because it's one dimensional. Uh, in that sense, it's like the real numbers. But uh, it, it is, of course, uh, exactly the case we're especially interested in, uh, in measurement. Now, uh, let's consider some examples. I mentioned congruence. Uh, the, it, what we want to talk about in terms of difference is a generalization of congruence in the sense that we want to talk about inequalities. So we want to say that one interval uh, is larger than another. And it's important that we be able to say that. Uh, an example from uh, psychophysics, a case of, uh, of comparison of differences, is a person, for example, might be given two, uh, two sounds and asked to find uh, a third sound uh, that just bisects uh, the difference. That is such that he's given sound A and C, and now he can adjust the apparatus to find B, such that he believes the difference between A and B is just the same as the difference between B and C. Uh, that'd be a characteristic use of the concept of, of difference. And that notion of bisection uh, is widely used in a variety of psychophysical experiments. In the chapter, uh, a number of uh, related uh, psychophysical methods are, are also discussed uh, at the beginning of the chapter. An important application in other parts of the social sciences would be in economics uh, to the notion of preference. And uh, here, a characteristic way of saying it is that in order to get cardinal utility, this is the way uh, classically economists have talked, in order to get uh, cardinal utility, we have to be able not only to order our preferences, but order our differences between preferences. So that, uh, for example, uh, if I uh, prefer uh, uh, a, a novel of, say, Jane Austen uh, is preferred uh, to a novel of Norman Mailer, some particular novel, and I also uh, say uh, that I prefer uh, a play by uh, Sam Shepard. Uh, it's preferred uh, to a play by uh, you can uh, put in your favorite uh, dramatist there. Let me put in, say, uh, Augie. Now what we would say is uh, that in order to get uh, a real sense of your preference and to have a cardinal utility, we, we have to ask for judgments. Well, do you prefer, prefer Austin? Is the difference between your preference for Austin over Mailer greater than your preference for Shepard over Aggie? Uh, and such questions of difference uh, are required uh, in order to go on from an ordinal sense of utility, just an ordering, to a cardinal utility, which in terms of the theory of measurement means uh, measurement up to uh, fixing a unit uh, and fixing a zero point, that is, a, uh, up to a linear transformation. 
Now, uh, historically in economics, there's been objection to the kind of thing I just described in the sense that uh, you can't get direct behavioral evidence for uh, the differences. You can get direct behavioral evidence in terms of the choices for the direct preferences, but not for the differences, uh, uh, the ordering of the differences. Uh, and it's been a, a subject of research to identify uh, many different ways of, uh, of observing directly or indirectly uh, the differences in preference as well as the preferences. Uh, that's discussed some of the chapter and uh, in many other places in the literature. Uh, I'll not review it here. It is important to be aware of the fact that there is a large and, and uh, at times rather uh, controversial literature uh, about the way in which one is to uh, get uh, evidence from uh, individuals about their differences, uh, not just their preferences, but uh, as it's sometimes put, uh, about their, another way, is about the intensity uh, of their preferences. Uh, and this use of intensity here uh, also uh, is important to remark that in the classical theory of measurement literature, me difference measurement uh, is um, often called intensive measurement, whereas what we have uh, talked about in the previous lectures about extensive measurement is contrasted, and the difference that one has in mind historically, this, this distinction goes back a very long ways. Uh, in intensive measurement, you don't have any natural operation of combination, uh, and, uh, whereas in extensive measurement, you do. And uh, as we said at the uh, introductory lecture in discussing some of the history, uh, of course, there are pa people in the past, like Norman Camel, who was in the earlier part of the century very influential in the uh, foundations of measurement, both the theory and the philosophy of measurement, who claimed that in the case of intensive measurement, there couldn't be any fundamental measurement. You couldn't start from scratch. Well, if, uh, if uh, Camel had thought at all of and uh, known very much geometry, he would have known how wrong uh, that idea was. And the examples we give in this lecture uh, illustrate also that in this classical sense, fundamental intensive measurement uh, is certainly possible. Um, it's important to note uh, immediately that there is a close relation between having a difference representation and an additive representation. An additive representation is shown here uh, if we have differences, algebraic differences. So we have the ref representation 5a minus 5b is equal to or greater than 5c minus 5d. Then immediately that's the same as saying in the additive representation 5a plus 5d is equal to or greater than 5c plus 5b. Now I mention that here because I won't return to this particular question uh, in, in much detail. But what that shows is then that difference measurement is very closely related uh, to conjoint measurement, where we have such an additive representation. And conjoint measurement is an important topic later on in this course uh, and in the, uh, also in Foundations of Measurement uh, book itself. I mentioned that there's this classical contrast between intensive and extensive measurement. Uh, it's uh, interesting to note again, and I don't think uh, Camel was at all aware of uh, Holder's important work of 1901, that in uh, Holder's classical paper on measurement of 1901, there's already a reduction of the intensive or, or, or difference case to the extensive measurement. And the idea is very, very simple. Uh, intuitively, you simply treat as an object uh, the differences. And let's take uh, these differences to be positive here. That'll be the simplest case. So A minus B is some positive, uh, thinking of it in real numbers, would be some positive real number. We can think of it abstractly uh, as a, a certain object. Uh, and if A minus B is the same as B minus C, then we have a combination of uh, A combined with A, which would be the same then uh, in terms of thinking of these, uh, the magnitude of the intervals as A minus C. So it's very clear. Uh, how you can set that up, and uh, Holder does that in a, in a very uh, well-defined and uh, conceptual way, in a very clear mathematical way. So it's uh, easy to reduce uh, uh, difference measurement in order to, for example, prove something uh, or to show the relation to extensive measurement. Now, I've already remarked about uh, some of these relations to uh, congruence. Uh, and uh, when we reflect on it and the various kinds of experiments that people are interested in, 
and the way they want to think about differences, there's sort of three obvious uh, variations, and we'll discuss uh, each of them uh, in differing degrees of detail. First, we can simply have positive differences. And so uh, this is very close to what I was saying about Holder. Uh, the interval AB is equal to or greater than the interval CD, and that's represented just by a function on the interval. Psi of AB, psi being a real valued function into the positive reals, phi of AB equal to or greater than phi of CD. And here we may, I said positive because we might only permit, as we will initially, the formation of intervals uh, when, this is, uh, uh, when this is positive. So we don't have the interval uh, AA. If we had AA, then that would be, that would be, uh, phi, we would have psi also being non-negative. Now, those positive differences are a natural thing. They, and, uh, a second thing, uh, algebraic differences, the sort of thing I mentioned a minute ago. Here, we do take account of the algebraic uh, sign. And the third one, which is closest to uh, congruence, uh, in the case of congruence, uh, it is exactly the absolute difference. In other words, we, aren't, we don't have naturally in geometry an alge a direction that would give us algebraic difference. Uh, it's an important thing to note. The algebraic difference relation corresponds to having the natural ordering on the real numbers. But it's an uh, important fact uh, about, say, the geometry of the plane or any higher dimension, taking the Euclidean case, that no non-trivial binary relation can be defined. So in particular, we don't have any natural ordering relation. So we don't have, in the geometric case, uh, the natural analog of algebraic differences. What we do have in the... Uh, what, or, in that sense, a natural analog of positive differences. What we do have in the geometric case is absolute differences. Uh, and uh, it's this case of absolute difference uh, that corresponds uh, most closely to the way we think of congruence in geometry. And the only generalization here is instead of simply taking uh, equivalence, uh, is to permit the inequality. It's rather interesting that it is so standard to take congruence in geometry, uh, we forget how natural it is to take the slightly, uh, slightly more general relation. Uh, in the case of different studies and the kind of applications uh, in various experiments, etc., uh, it's useful to have uh, uh, the inequality. Now, m the program here is to discuss in decreasing detail these three cases. So we'll start with the positive difference case. And uh, what we want to do is give axioms from which we can prove uh, a standard representation theorem and uniqueness theorem. And so let's take a look uh, uh, at the axioms for positive difference. Now, first, in terms of the primitive concepts, we start with a non-empty set A of objects. Could be tones. I mean, depends on the, on the application. Could be preference cases. There are any one of many different kinds of uh, interpretations we would make in different sciences and for different experimental or empirical purposes. Uh, we then have a non-empty subset, A starred, of the Cartesian product of A with itself. Notice that this is a, a primitive concept because it's a non-empty uh, subset. It's not the whole of the Cartesian product because, for example, we don't want the uh, intervals that reflect negative differences. That is, if AB is positive, BA would be negative. We're not going to permit BA uh, to be in A starred. We also aren't going to permit an A starred uh, AA, that is, the case that would be zero. And then we have the usual ordering relation on A starred. The axioms, uh, we want to look at uh, a bit because uh, they are like some of those in the case of extensive measurement, uh, but uh, naturally they are uh, have some characteristic differences uh, because we have a a, a different setup. For example, uh, what is in, important to note here in terms of what I said earlier about intensive and extensive measurement, we don't have any operation here. We only have uh, an ordering relation, but that ordering relation uh, is sufficient. The first axiom uh, is just that uh, uh, we have a, a weak ordering uh, of A starred. And uh, the second axiom, uh, the rest of the axioms have a very simple uh, meaning when we draw a picture. 
Uh, and the axioms look a little more complicated than they are because due to the fact that A star doesn't include all, all pairs, we always have to postulate the necessary pairs are in A starred for the axiom to make sense. Uh, the second axiom, I guess I can draw the picture right here. Uh, that just says, if we think on the line, we have AB, and this will be positive in the line, it'd be simpler to draw that way, AB, and we have BC, then we want to have the closure property if AB is in A starred, and BC is, then we want the closure property that the larger interval AC uh, is in A starred. And the reason for that closure property on A starred is that we want to be able to have additivity. Uh, intuitively, this axiom uh, says that we have closure in A starred under addition of adjacent intervals. And uh, it, it'd be a, a rather uh, awkward mathematical structure if we didn't postulate that. Uh, the third axiom, uh, also says, using that same diagram, which we can draw here, that if we have A, B, and C, uh, then if we look at A, B, and we look at B, C, uh, we would expect that the whole interval A, C, the addition of A, B, and B, C, must be strictly greater than either A, B, or B, C. And notice the strict positivity of all of the intervals in A star uh, can be seen from axiom three. Uh, axiom four is uh, a very natural uh, uh, additivity axiom in the same spirit. But this axiom says if we have within A star A, B, and C, and we, so we have A, B, and B, C, and we also have the intervals A prime, B prime, and C prime. I've, I've drawn it. I'm going to redraw it. I do it rather badly for the intuitive meaning. I want to make the intervals A, B, and C larger than the prime ones, A, B, and C. What this is now, if we compare A, B, and A prime, B prime, and A, B is the unprimed interval is bigger, we compare B, C with B prime, C prime, and the B, C is bigger than B prime, C prime, then this whole interval A, C is going to be greater than A prime, C prime. Now, that's extremely intuitive. And so what we get from axiom four is a kind of monotonicity of, of, of ordering uh, under a combination or a, uh, a kind of additivity. Now, axiom five uh, is, uh, again, a structural axiom uh, that shows if we have a picture, let's draw a picture again, if we have A, B, uh, and that's greater than, say, C, D, and notice I'm making it positive to the left, easy to draw that way, keeping the left to right ordering the letters. Then we can have a D prime uh, such that uh, A, D prime, there exists such that A, D prime uh, is equivalent to C, D. Historical remarks in order there, uh, what that really corresponds to is the classical axiom in geometry for laying off segments. We're given a segment of given length CD. We have a segment array AB. Starting from A, we go to B. Then we can find the point D prime such that AD prime uh, is equivalent to CD. So this axiom corresponds to that classical laying off of segments. Uh, and we also have uh, that uh, we can find uh, another point. It's symmetric. Uh, D double prime. D double prime, such a D double prime B is also equivalent to CD, which in terms of that laying off of segments mean we could have started at B and going toward A. Uh, we get uh, that point D double prime. So that's very natural uh, construction. Uh, it's not something, of course, that would always hold uh, if we were given an arbitrary set A. We're postulating uh, a structure on, on A that permits this axiom to be satisfied. Uh, in uh, the kind of... Uh, bisection experiment I mentioned earlier, uh, we could uh, uh, certainly uh, find that. Uh, for example, uh, we could, uh, in that case, get a special case of D prime equal to D double prime. Uh, or more generally, if we heard two tones, CD, we could find, and given A, we could find the D prime, such that AD prime is equivalent to CD, uh, et cetera. Same thing about preferences. Uh, I could give many different empirical examples. Uh, the geometrical meaning, though, 
uh, is perhaps the simplest to say in a very direct way. It's just like laying off of segments. And finally, we have a sixth axiom, which I uh, haven't written down formally because it uh, has a more or less standard form in terms of standard sequences. That's given on page 147 of the text uh, and is, of course, necessary uh, uh, and to uh, get the desired representation. Let's turn now to the theorem we want to get uh, given these uh, six axioms on a positive different structure. What we assert is, as a representation theorem, there exists a real valued function psi from mapping A star into the positive reals such that if A, B, and C, D are in A star, then A, B is judged equal to or greater than C, D uh, as intervals if and only if psi of A, B equal to or greater than psi of C, D. And secondly, we have the kind of additivity for adjacent intervals. If A, B, and B, C are in A star, then psi of A, C is just equal to psi of A, B plus psi of B, C. Uh, you can see how close this representation is to what I was saying earlier about the uh, holder reduction to extensive measurement. The uniqueness part of the proof then, or the uniqueness theorem, rather, the uniqueness theorem asserts that psi is unique up to a racial scale or up to a similarity transformation. Namely, if we have a psi prime with the same two properties, then there exists a real number alpha greater than zero such that psi prime is equal to alpha psi. And second part now of the theorem uh, that strengthens the structure but is important in terms of getting a real valued function on the individual objects. Moreover, if for every A and B and A, that is the original set of objects A, and A not equal to B, we either have A, B, or B, A, and A star. So it means that A star is now uh, a, uh, a complete ordering uh, and not a partial ordering. Then there exists a real valued function phi from A, not A star, from A into the reals such that psi of AB equals 5A minus 5B. And secondly, relative to this psi, if we have any other such phi prime, then that means be equal to phi plus beta. A uh, beta, of course, uh, being uh, a translation parameter. Uh, and this is what we'd expect. But notice, of course, uh, that uh, as in the case of the geometry, when we get to the objects themselves, not the length of the intervals, but the objects themselves, we don't have uh, a natural origin. That's reflected in, in, uh, in beta here. That, that's what we mean by having a, uh, an interval scale. All right, now let, let's take a look at the proof of this theorem. Uh, the first place we want to simply, as I said, follow Holder's idea. Uh, now, the first thing we have to look at in carrying through that idea technically is that if I had an interval AB and one CD, I can't concatenate them where they aren't adjacent. Well, there's an obvious move we make uh, in the theory of measurement, and it's uh, a characteristic move and one we we use here, we form equivalence classes so, and then we can concatenate the equivalence classes arbitrarily because we can be assured there's an appropriate concrete representation uh, to carry out uh, the operation. So we form the equivalence class given any interval AB, we form the equivalence class AB. I've shown that here by underlining uh, in the text it's printed in boldface. A, B, the equivalence class AB is the set of all intervals CD and A starred such that CD is equivalent to AB. Then we want to form the set B, which is the set of all intervals in A starred uh, underline. That is the set of all these intervals. Uh, and there exists uh, AB uh, such that AB is uh, in gamma and BC is in delta. That is, there exists AB and BC in the original set A such that AB is in gamma, BC is in delta. So, in other words, B is just the carrying of the, uh, of the pairs up to, uh, up to the equivalence classes. That is, a comparison of, uh, of intervals. And then the operation O is a mapping of B uh, into A star. So we combine these pairs to go into A star. Now notice something, so we're to be clear about it. B is itself not the ordering relation at the equivalence class level. We postulate we have the equivalent, we bring that 
the equivalence class relation up in the standard way, printing it in boldface or underlining it as we wish. B is a set of, of, uh, of uh, equivalence classes of, of, uh, of intervals, pairs of equivalence classes of intervals. We need this in order to get the exact structure uh, for the representation we want, to reduce this to one of the standard cases we would use, for example, uh, in extensive measurement. Uh, before we say that, let's look at this simple lemma that if we have gamma O delta equals AC, and notice gamma now is an equivalence class of intervals, delta is an equivalence class of intervals, and by the way we define it here, we have this, this concatenation. Then there exists a B and A that just gives us AB equal gamma and BC equal delta. Uh, and that's obvious from the construction. Uh, we can show that's always the case using axiom five, the one I just uh, discussed, uh, the axiom I like to call the one corresponding geometrically to the laying off of segments. All right, now what we want to show on the basic proof that'll get us, get us the function psi, the real valued function psi, is now to take this structure we've defined, A star, uh, the ordering on A star equivalence classes and the ordering, which I would have put boldface like that, B and the and concatenation, that structure we want to show is just an Archimedean regular positive ordered local semigroup. Now that's just definition 2.2. And if you go back to 2.2, uh, that's in chapter 2, definition 2, there are eight axioms that we need to satisfy. And we'll make a quick review of those axioms. We can show that this structure we so constructed, by using the axioms directly on positive differences, will satisfy the axioms for this uh, local semigroup, uh, which will then give us immediately the representation psi. First, uh, we have to have a simple order. Well, as a characteristic move, when we take equivalence classes and we have start with a weak order, we get a simple order under the equivalence class structure. So that's direct to satisfy uh, axiom one. Uh, axiom two is that we want a monotone closure of B, which says is that if we have gamma delta in B, gamma is greater than gamma prime, delta greater than delta prime, then gamma prime delta prime must be in B. Uh, and that's easy to construct uh, from, uh, from uh, the axioms we, we've got for positive difference. I won't, uh, maybe I'll say something about it. Uh, we let Let's take the case where gamma equals AB, and where gamma is, I, is equivalent to gamma prime, there's no problem. Let's take gamma strictly greater than, greater than gamma prime. So we choose a B prime, which we can, such that AB prime, B prime B is an A star. And uh, AB prime is equal to gamma prime. Essentially, we're using axiom five. So the picture looks like this. We have AB and BC, now we can choose this B prime. But once we've chosen that B prime, it's easy to show, as the picture shows, that B prime C is at least as great, B prime C is at least as great as B C as an interval. And then we can choose C prime such that B prime C prime uh, is equal to delta prime, and so we have gamma prime delta prime in B. Axiom three and four for these local semigroups, uh, monotonicity, and that follows immediately from axiom four. Remember. Uh, uh, axiom four is a kind of uh, monotonicity under uh, addition of uh, intervals of the ordering relation. Addition, I should say, of adjacent intervals. Uh, so that comes from axiom four, uh, which I drew a picture. Uh, here's the axiom, and there's the picture. Remember, we have AB greater than A prime B prime, BC greater than B prime C prime, then AC greater than A prime C prime. Um, Axiom five is to show that the operation of, of concatenation we defined is associative. Uh, that's straightforward, and I won't say much more about it. Uh, easy to show from the construction. Uh, positivity, well, we already have positivity of the intervals from looking directly at axiom three, namely that any interval that we get from three easily, every, every interval uh, is positive. Uh, and regularity, again, regularity means here the postulating of the kind of objects that, to give us these equivalences we get with D prime and D double prime. So regularity, which is axiom seven, comes directly from axiom five for positive differences. And finally, axiom eight, which I haven't written down here, is of course the standard Archimedean axiom, Archimedean axiom for the local semigroups, and we can show that 
the Archimedean axiom for positive differences gives us in the structure of this local semigroup a satisfaction of that axiom. So uh, what we've done, and it's a characteristic move always when we can do it, we reduce one of these proofs, instead of starting from scratch, we reduce one to something already proved, uh, as we've done here. Having done that, uh, it then follows at once uh, that the function psi we posited, remember, psi is a real valued function that preserves the order on the intervals and has this property of addition uh, of addition adjacent intervals. Such a function psi then exists immediately from the known theorem for the local semigroup satisfying definition 2.2. The next thing now we want to look at very quickly uh, to finish this is the construction uh, uh, of the function uh, phi. Uh, let's turn to that. So to finish the proof, uh, we define phi uh, in terms of psi as follows. We pick an a sub 0 that intuitively will have uh, the uh, assignment the number 0 to it. So phi of a equals psi of a a 0, that is the interval a to a 0, if a a 0 is positive, that is an a starred. Uh, phi of a is 0 if, of course, a is identical to a 0, and phi of a is minus or the negative of the value of psi of a a 0 if a 0 a is positive, that is, a 0 a is an a starred. And then it's straightforward to show, as it's uh, done in detail in the chapter, that 5a has the expected properties. Let's now turn to the second case of differences, the case of algebraic differences. Here the primitives are simpler because uh, we have the relation hold for all pairs. So we just have a non-empty set A and then an ordering relation on the Cartesian product of A with itself. The, the axioms are also simpler because we don't have to guarantee uh, this uh, being an A starred that we had in the case of positive differences. Uh, the axioms of the three cases discussed in detail in the chapter, positive structures, algebraic differences, and absolute differences, uh, the axioms certainly are the simplest for the algebraic differences. The first axiom is, as before, just the weak ordering uh, of the pairs, that is, of the differences, the algebraic differences, under the binary relation the familiar axiom. Uh, the second axiom catches the essential algebraic character, namely, if the interval AB is equal to or greater than CD, then DC is equal to or greater than BA. And notice how simple that is algebraically. So al algebraically, we have A minus C, B equal to or greater than C minus D. Uh, then we have immediately that D minus C is equal to or greater uh, than B minus A. Uh, just multiplying through by minus 1 and reversing the inequality in the familiar fashion. So that's just the meaning of axiom 2. Axiom 3, well, that's just our uh, monotonicity axiom for positive differences uh, that we uh, discussed earlier in the same form. If AB, the interval AB is at least as great as A prime B prime, and BC is at least as great as B prime C prime, then putting a, B, and B, C together, we get an interval A, C, which is at least as great or greater than A prime, C prime. Uh, and axiom four is just the regularity axiom uh, we discussed, had for positive differences in, in the, uh, with the obvious minor changes. If we have A, B interval is at least as great as C, D, which is at least as great as the null interval, A, A, then we have D prime, D double prime, such that we can find uh, AD prime equivalent to CD equivalent to D prime B. And I drew a picture for that in discussing positive differences. And finally, axiom five, uh, we have the Archimedean axiom that I'm not stating explicitly. But notice, uh, we just have five axioms here, and they have a very simple form. Uh, I might say these axioms result from uh, several that have been given in the literature, the history of the various axioms for algebraic differences is stated, and this represents, I think, uh, essentially about as simple uh, a set of axioms as we can expect to get uh, for the general case. Uh, now, the representation theorem is then slightly different. We want to go directly. We don't have a function psi. We want to go directly to a phi on the individuals in A, individual objects. 
So there exists a real valued function phi on A such that the interval AB is equal to or greater than CD if and only if phi of A minus phi B equal to or greater than phi C minus phi of D. Uh, that's the change we'd expect for algebraic differences. Uh, the uniqueness, phi is unique up to a positive linear transformation. That is, uh, the zero point is arbitrary uh, and the unit is arbitrary. Now, the proof of this representation theorem, once we have the proof for positive differences, is very straightforward. The idea is completely simple. Uh, the complete details are given in the chapter. Uh, let's be clear about the idea. We reduce an algebraic difference structure to a positive difference structure and show them the axioms for positive difference structures are satisfied uh, uh, in this uh, reduced version. So we want to define first A starred. AB is an A starred if and only if AB is strictly greater than AA, the null, uh, the null interval. And we restrict the ordering relation to the ordering relation starred is just the restriction of the ordering relation for algebraic differences to A starred. And then we define uh, a set of equivalent objects. A, B are equivalent. Well, formally, we can put it neither A, B nor B, A is an A starred. Intuitively, it just means that in the ordering, uh, A is equivalent to B, where, where we now define in the natural way for algebraic differences from the weak ordering uh, for the differences we, get the, we define in a natural way using this null interval. We define the ordering on objects. So that's intuitively the content of E. And then we just have these E equivalence classes, and we prove in a direct way that uh, we have satisfaction for these E equivalence classes uh, of the positive difference structures using A star as shown. Uh, and I won't, uh, I won't walk through the details of that. It's very similar to what we've already uh, discussed uh, for positive difference structures. The reduction is, is intuitively uh, quite straightforward. Uh, there is an important uh, point, not only a, 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 a mathematical point about the representation, but one that is uh, sometimes of concern in uh, applications. Namely, we can have alternative numerical representations. Remember, uh, as we emphasize uh, in the discussion of the various representation theorems, the exact form of the numerical representation uh, is not God-given. There are alternative choices, and there's nothing in the mathematical structures themselves, these alternative structures for numerical representation, that dictate a choice to us. Uh, it's a matter of convenience, what fits in with the theoretical setting uh, they're going to be used, uh, and so forth. So we can, in the case of algebraic differences, if we define a function psi, now this psi has nothing to do with the psi function I defined in proving the representation theorem for positive differences. This is a new psi. If psi is defined as uh, e to the phi, then uh, psi in this form is a racial representation. And this familiar exponential relation here between psi and phi is a way of going uh, from the difference representation to the uh, ratio. And obviously, you can go from the ratio to the phi by taking logarithms. And the racial representation has in this kind of, of formulation where we, the interval AB is at least as great as CD if and only if the ratio of 5A to 5B is equal to or greater than 5C to 5D. And uh, of course, phi and psi aren't at all linear transformations of each other. That's obviously being exponential. And I, I want to come back to that now by considering an elementary special case that puts in, in particularly interesting focus uh, how we think about phi and psi. And that's the case where we don't satisfy the general axioms here, but we have a weaker structure for algebraic differences uh, that has some applications. It's been used was used, for example, uh, more than 20 years ago uh, by uh, my colleagues and myself in some experiments on utilities, utility differences. That is, when we go to finite structure of algebraic differences, but we have equal spacing. 
So we think of the objects as being spaced in the ordering this way. So intuitively, this interval, each atomic interval is equal to each other, every other. Now, to formally express this equality of, of atomic intervals, we have this notion of a, of a successor relation J. B is the successor of J if and only if AB strictly greater than AA, that is the null relation, and is not the case there exists a C such that AB is strictly greater than AC, greater than null. That is, you can't find, if you have A and we have B here, we can't find a C in between. So the way to read that is uh, A precedes B in the ordering, immediately precedes, or B is the immediate successor of A. We'll see how we use that axiom. All right, now our axioms, uh, the first three axioms are just what we had before. We have a weak order, and we have a finite set A now in the same ordering relation. Axiom two is just as I discussed earlier. Axiom three is just as I discussed earlier. Remember, let's remember what two and three are. A axiom 2 is just an uh, algebraic axiom. If AB at least as great as CD, then reversing sign, DC is at least as great as BA. And axiom 3, the monotonicity axiom. So we have those three simple axioms, weak order, uh, algebraic sign, monotonicity. And we just add one more axiom. If A is the immediate predecessor of B and C is the immediate predecessor of, of D, then the interval AB is equivalent to CD. So, for example, draw out a picture. We have A here and B here is an atomic interval. And C, D is an atomic interval. That C is the immediate predecessor of D. Then we say that these two intervals must be equivalent. So that equal spacing is a particularly simple structure. And uh, we can get immediately from these four axioms. Everything, as you'll notice, is totally elementary. Because of the finiteness, no Archimedean axiom is needed. Uh, we can get uh, a similar representation uh, of a function phi, unique up to linear transformation. Now, uh, interesting question. Which way do we want to re represent those equal differences? Uh, in terms of ratios uh, or in terms of, uh, of differences? And I think our choice, and we see it particularly vividly here in this very simple equal spacing structure, our choice is to whether have a, a difference representation, a numerical difference or a numerical ratio, uh, will depend on uh, uh, the, the, the framework of application. And I, and I might say probably as much as anything, uh, if we're dealing in, in, in uh, an area where there isn't a, uh, an extensive theoretical development, uh, then it'll be chosen, that is, the representation as a different structure or as a Racial structure uh, will be chosen depending on what, what the history uh, of usage has been in this particular area of study, as, for example, in many cases in psychophysics. Now, the third case of differences, the case of absolute differences, I won't state the axioms uh, because the, the axioms. The flavor of the axioms are similar. There have to be technical differences. An interesting aspect of the axioms that are given in the chapter for absolute difference is that only, only, only the Cartesian product of A itself and the relation is required. Uh, and in the earlier discussions, for example, by Holder and in uh, early axiomization by uh, myself and Wynnett, uh, we also, uh, because of having algebraic, uh, I mean, uh, absolute differences, we also added a, an ordering relation on A. So, and it was shown by Krantz and Tversky that this ordering on A is not needed, that you can construct, if you're a little clever about it, you can construct from this ordering of the absolute differences an ordering on A, a cross uh, from the ordering on A cross A, we can construct a difference, uh, an ordering on A itself. Uh, and the details of that are, are uh, gone through rather carefully in the chapter, and I won't discuss that in the resulting axioms. Uh, in this lecture, uh, I, I think in many ways, when you look at the various axioms, it's quite clear uh, that the, the nicest axioms 
in the same, as an axiomatic structure uh, are those for algebraic differences. But in many uh, applications, we're really interested in either positive differences or absolute differences. Moreover, as remarked, absolute differences are the different structures that correspond to the classical case of congruence, and also they're close to the idea of, uh, of distance for uh, an arbitrary metric space. So that uh, from a geometrical standpoint, uh, even though the axioms are more complicated, the absolute differences uh, represent uh, the natural concept.